William Paley lived from 1743 to 1805, and he was a philosopher, an Anglican clergyman, and uh, he was a Christian apologist. He was somebody who argued on behalf of Christianity, defending it against objections and giving arguments to believe in Christian doctrines. He was also an abolitionist. He was um, a proponent for outlawing slavery. Um, a little bit before it was cool. Uh, he was obviously an Englishman, and he wrote a number of uh, well-known books in his lifetime, as we'll see. But the argument we're going to look at now comes from his Natural Theology of 1802. Um, now, some philosophers take the view that Hume's uh, thoughts about design arguments just devastate any kind of argument uh, for God's existence from apparent design in the world. And uh, the thing is, this, this book, Natural Theology, in 1802, contains a very elaborate and famous and trenchantly argued design argument. And so some philosophers have taken the view that Paley, poor sap, what a loser. He, he was refuted by Hume. Uh, even before he wrote his stupid book in 1802. You know, isn't, isn't that sad? I don't think that's right, though. Paley, it turns out, had read Hume and thought about Hume's criticisms very carefully. And it turns out that Paley's design argument really isn't like Hume's argument. Paley famously uh, says, imagine that you're walking across a field and you see a stone lying there. Well, for all you know, the stone has just been there forever. Um, you don't need to appeal to, you don't obviously need to appeal to intelligent design to explain uh, your observation of the stone. Let's suppose you find a watch in the field and you pick it up and look at it and it just seems obvious that all these parts were intended by somebody to perform some function. So, uh, in a lot of his book, uh, he's he's actually going through what was known of biological structures like eyes, like the human eyeball, but he's not drawing an analogy between eyes and telescopes or eyes and cameras and arguing like this, the telescope was designed, the eye is like the telescope, therefore probably the eye was designed. Rather, his point is that there's as much evidence to think the eye was designed as there is evidence to think that the telescope was designed. So really what he's comparing is two arguments or two inferences. He's not comparing directly two things. So this design argument, as we'll see, doesn't depend on uh, an analogy between two different objects. Again, it, it's comparing two different inferences. Let's see how that works. I'll, you can stop the video now and uh, read this quote from Darwin. So you can see he mentions three of Paley's books here. His books are required reading at Cambridge University where Darwin went. And a lot of people read his uh, books and were very impressed with his design argument. So this is interesting. We'll look at some other quotes from Darwin farther on in this lecture. Um, I depend from my analysis of Paley's argument on some really great work by a philosopher named Eliot Sober. Eliot Sober is one of the leading philosophers of biology. He teaches at the University of Wisconsin. And this is from a book called uh, Philosophy of Biology, published in 1993. There's also a more recent edition as well. And Sober says, um, look, Paley's argument uh, is brilliant. Sober is a naturalist, and he does not believe in a god or in any sort of creator. But he thinks that Paley's design argument is a brilliant argument, and that it isn't refuted by Hume's considerations about arguments from analogy. Uh, so to explain his analysis, we have to look at what he calls the likelihood principle. So O here is some observed fact, and then we have two hypotheses, H1 and H2, two different explanations of O. The likelihood principle says that an observation O strongly favors hypothesis 1 over hypothesis 2 if and only if H1 assigns to O a probability that is much bigger than the probability that H2 assigns to O. That is, the probability of O, assuming H1, is much greater than, that's what this means, 
much greater than the probability of the hypothesis O on H2. So here's an example of how that applies. So we have the thesis W, the watch is intricate and well suited to timekeeping. This is something we observe to be true. And then D is the thesis, the hypothesis that the watch is the product of intelligent design. R is the hypothesis that the watch is the product of random, that is non-purposeful physical processes. Of course, D and R can't both be true. They're rival hypotheses. And the point applied to this argument would be that the probability of W assuming D is much higher than the probability of W assuming R. It's more likely that we'd see the watch being this way on the assumption that it was intelligently designed than on the assumption that it resulted from random physical processes. Hence the better explanation of W is D. Or at least the observation W supports D over R. Similarly, we have the, the observation E, the human eye, is well suited to the task of enabling vision in a great variety of circumstances. And then we have C and V, two rival hypotheses. C is the human design, the human eye is a product of intelligent design, and V is the human eye is a product of random, that is non-purposeful physical forces. And here the application is this, the probability of E on C, the probability of this well-suitedness in the eye that we observe uh, assuming C is much higher than the probability of that observation on V. Hence the better explanation of E, what we observe, is C. Or at least the observation E supports C over V. So the point is that the subject matter is different, but the reasoning process is the same. Both are examples of what philosophers of science call inference to the best explanation. Thus, the inference about the eye is as reasonable as the inference about the watch. So again, he's, he's comparing inferences, and he says nobody disputes the inference about the watch, um, but the reasoning process is the same. So no one should dispute the conclusion about um, there being a designer of, say, the human eye. And of course it would apply to a lot of other things than eyes. So Paley goes through a whole big long list of objections and replies, and I'm going to run through these with you now. The first group of these are what Paley would say are irrelevant facts or possibilities um, so someone might try to challenge his point about the uh, watch. And he's, he's saying, look, that really is the same as the case of the eye. And it would really be wrong-headed to raise points like these. Uh, I've never seen a watch being made. Paley would say, so? You can still observe the adaptation of means to ends. Well, I'm incapable of making a watch or I can't understand how watches are made. Paley says, look, all these are true about some of the stuff that archaeologists actually dig up. You might dig up some really elaborate objects made of, say, stone, and you've never seen anything like that being made. You couldn't make something like that. You don't really know how it was made. But it still might be obvious to you that it was made. That's his point. Uh, I don't know if this thing was made by a human or by some other intelligent being. Well, what if you don't? You still know it was intelligently designed, right? How about this? The watch sometimes malfunctions or is always a little off. Paley says whether we can we, we understand this malfunction, whether we can explain it or not, doesn't seem to matter. It's still obvious that there is a designer that intended the watch to do certain things. Why think that design requires uh, a perfect or an unbreakable product? Someone might say, well, I don't know the functions of some parts of the watch. 
and I can't tell whether some parts even contribute to the main function of the watch at all. Paley would say, so, maybe there are superfluous parts. Maybe there are truly useless parts that don't contribute to the function. And again, maybe the parts have functions that you don't understand, but look, that doesn't infer, that none of this weakens our inference that the watch came from intelligent design, right? So all this is just kicking up dust, trying to raise a cloud of dust and obscure the obvious. Here's another group of objections with Paley's replies. These take the form, really, of what Paley would say are lame counter-arguments. Attempts to undermine the inference about the watch that don't work. Someone might say, this bunch of matter had to have some configuration or other, so why not this one? The watch's structure is obviously one possible way matter can be combined. So what's the big surprise? Um, sure, but you could say the same thing about the stone, but uh, the watch is different, right? Someone might say maybe a natural principle, a natural source of order is responsible for the watch. Paley says, we've never seen anything like this in action. If we're not talking about an intelligent agent, then I don't know what you're talking about, basically. The, the suggestion is unintelligible. It can't be understood. This looks like a desperate attempt to just avoid the obvious inference. Someone might say the observed features of a watch aren't evidence for a design. They only tend to make us believe that it was designed. Or the watch is just the result of the natural laws governing the behavior of metals. Paley says, no, give me a break. Laws of nature are not causes. They just uh, represent the, ma uh, the manner in which whatever causal agents there are operate. Someone might say, Paley just doesn't know what he's talking about. Paley says, I may know just a little bit, but it gives me enough evidence to conclude that this watch was designed, even if I really don't even know what the purpose of it is, don't know what most of the parts do, and so on. So Paley is a wily and tough arguer, and he, he seems to bat down a bunch of irrelevant uh, points and lame counter-arguments that people come up with. And uh, this is why Paley's famous. He developed this argument from, um, from design in a very thorough and careful manner. I'm going to throw some questions out there. I'm not going to answer all of them. I'm going to leave some of them for you to address. Um, first, if this sort of argument is successful, what exactly would it establish? Secondly, the above replies are supposed to work equally well in the case of the eye. Remember, we were sticking with the analogous case of the watch that we found in the field. Um, would they work as well in the case of the eye? Paley would say so. What do you think? Thirdly, is there a cumulative case for a designer of nature, as Paley suggests? Paley's idea is um, that science is progressing and we're discovering more and more about things like eyes and kidneys and um, you know the appendix and the structure of leaves and uh, the motions of planets and things like that and the more and more cases of amazing things whose parts are arranged uh, towards some end, towards some goal, uh, the more reason we have to believe that natural things are designed. Maybe even to believe that the whole universe is designed. Well, is that right or not? What do you think?